This is a Faith Defenders audio presentation with author, lecturer, and Christian apologist, Dr. Bob Mooring. We have been examining week after week in your word the story of your mighty acts and deeds throughout redemptive history. And how that you appeared in human form in the garden to Adam and Eve. You appeared in human form to Noah, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Moses, to Isaiah. And then you gave the final incarnation through Mary. And we realized the great significance of the fact that something was done that had never been done before. That Jesus Christ was God of very God as well as man of very man. Two natures, one person. Unique, thus he is called the monogenes huios, the unique son. Because there's no one else like him, before him or after him. He stands alone as the God-man, theanthropic in his very nature. We ask that you would bless us as we meditate upon your word concerning the glory of Christmas. In Christ's name, amen. Would you please turn with me to the Gospel of John? We have four Gospels because there were four questions that were posed in the first century. And the four questions were based upon ethnic and cultural differences. So Matthew wrote to the Jews and he answered their question, what did this Jesus teach that we should follow him? How does this teaching compare to that of Moses? We have Moses and now you're telling us about Yeshua, Joshua or Jesus. Well, what did he teach? Thus the Gospel of Matthew gives us the most extensive record of the teachings, sayings and sermons of Jesus. Matter of fact, if you took a pair of scissors and you removed out of the Gospel of Matthew everything related to his speaking, you would be reduced to a few pages. Now Mark wrote his Gospel to the Italians, to the Romans who had invaded the land and these soldiers who were now occupying the country, uh, this gave them a great opportunity to evangelize them. But knowing that soldiers don't really want to be backpacking around thick scrolls, he wrote the smallest, almost like a track. And he answered the question, what did this guy Jesus do that we should believe in him? Thus Mark is not interested in sermons, he's not interested in genealogy, he's not interested in the Jewish things, because he's dealing with Italians. And they wanted to know what kind of power and authority in the Greek exousia did this Jesus weld that uh, they should believe in him. Thus the Gospel of Mark emphasizes one miracle after another always introducing them by that word exousia or power. Thus you read right from chapter 1 all the way through, thus he had the power to forgive sin. He had the power over the wind and the waves. He had the power over demons. In order to encourage these soldiers that when they thought of someone who was powerful, forget Caesar because Yeshua, Jesus, had the power over sickness and sin and even hell, death and the grave. Thus they should believe in him. Luke wrote his gospel to the Greeks answering their question, who followed him? Who followed him? And this is why Luke in his genealogy traces back the lineage of Jesus all the way to Adam. Not just to Abraham. Remember he didn't write to Jews. The Jews were content, stop with Abraham. Once you get to Isaac and Jacob to Abraham, well then you don't need to go any further. But Luke says, let's go all the way back to Adam. Because Jesus was the Son of Man, the universal Savior. And that is why Luke gives us these precious biographies. Little stories about people that no one else mentions. I mean, there was that old woman in the temple. There was the old man in the temple. 
Nobody else mentions them. They were insignificant when it came to the stage of history. They didn't launch any armies, didn't have any big money influence. It just were two godly old people rattling around the temple, probably in the way most of the time. Shouting hallelujah, worshiping God. But you know what happened when Jesus was brought in? Old Simeon said, now I have seen the Messiah. And he was ready to die. So Luke tells us about Gentiles and Jews and Greeks. He talks about rich people, poor people, kids. Luke emphasizes and deals with the issue who followed him because he wanted the Greeks to understand they could follow Jesus. They didn't have to be a Jew to accept Jesus. They could be Greek. They could be Italian. They can be hot and tot. They can be whatever they want. But when you come to the Gospel of John, it was written to Christians who had the question, who was he? We've seen what he taught. We've seen what he did. Who follows him? Well, then who in the world was he? And this is why the Gospel of John, written to Christians, emphasizes the absolute deity of Jesus of Nazareth. That he was not simply a carpenter. He was not simply a rabbi. He wasn't simply a good man. Now, my wife was raised Unitarian Universalist. And she was taught that Jesus was nice. Like Abraham Lincoln, she was never told that he was God manifested in the flesh, the Son of God. The Son. She was taught he was a nice guy. And you see the liberals will say, well, he's nice. There was a letter in the Orange County Register by one of these disinformation Muslim uh, services. We Muslims celebrate Christmas too, which the whole thing was a lie from beginning to end because it is, hello, illegal to celebrate Christmas in Muslim countries. Matter of fact, it is capital punishment. If you're in Saudi Arabia, you're caught singing a Christmas carol, you're not just fined, you go to prison and you are facing the death penalty. But in this Muslim disinformation, we Muslims honor Jesus. Well, see, everybody basically has to pay lips. He was a good man. He was a good man. He was nice. Well, you see, John wants you to understand that Christianity, Christianity, is not about a nice guy who did some good things for people. There are a lot of good people in the world. Some of you are very good people. Didn't used to be, but you are now. There, we got some good women in this church, full of good works. Good grandmas making sugar cookies. We got some good people. We even got a few good children. Most of them are brats. We call them the Braticus Maximus. But we got a few good kids here and there rattling around. Don't require spanking every day. You know, they, they're just obedient. There's a few of them running around. But you see, the point is this. John, writing to Christians, said, Now, let's get something straight. The identity of the person who is the reason for the season has to be clarified and it must be emphatically stated. And I have arranged John's discussion along five C's. Five C's. The five C's of the Christ of Christmas in the Gospel of John. First is creation, then cradle, cross, crypt, and crown. So there's your five C's. Creation, cradle, cross, crypt, and crown. And in order to appreciate what the Apostle John had to say, you follow this basic outline. That's why as you turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 1, you will understand why he did not begin with the manger. He didn't. The one, he's not writing to Yehudim. He's not writing to a bunch of Jews who were concerned about the Malachi 5-2 prophecy. He was writing to Christians that he would understand the pre-existence of the intelligence 
that came to us through the womb of the Virgin Mary that we knew as Jesus of Nazareth that the intelligence, the mind, the intellect, the true person that was tabernacling in that flesh pre-existed his conception in the womb. And thus, Jesus is the eternal Son of God incarnate in human form. And you see, the pre-existence of Jesus, that he did not begin when the egg divided in the womb of Mary was so crucial to New Testament Christianity that not only is it stated in the positive, but when John wrote his first epistle, he emphasized it as a point of heresy and orthodoxy. This is why in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, Beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether or not they are from God. Because many false prophets have come into the world. The word for false is pseudo, counterfeit. You know, it's getting so nowadays that you give them a $20 bill and they're marking it, holding up to the light. God forbid you give them a $100 bill and they get out five markers. I've had the misfortune of ending up with the counterfeit bill. I didn't know it. I didn't print it up in the back room. I got it palmed off me. And you know what they did? They confiscated it on the spot. And they didn't give me a fresh new one. It was counterfeit. It was a ringer. It was a fraud. He said, there are frauds out there. Just turn on the television like I did this morning, and the frauds were out in dozens. By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, and the tense of the verb for come means Jesus Christ has come and remains in the flesh. Now you see the emphasis upon the pre-existence. Before he was conceived in the womb, he was the eternal Son of God. And that's why John says, look, we're going to talk about who is he. And let's begin at the beginning, in the beginning, in our K. And that's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Breshit from Genesis 1-1. Breshit bara Elohim hashemayim baharetz. When the beginning began is Genesis 1-1. Now in the Greek Septuagint, the old ancient Jewish translation of the Old Testament, it says in RK, in the beginning. John says, now, we're going to discuss the identity of this Jesus. In the beginning, capital B, the beginning, numero uno, the big one, the big bang, the beginning, not the beginning of Mary, not the beginning of the nation, not the beginning of this, the beginning of the entire universe. When the beginning of the universe began, when the beginning began, the Word already was in existence. He was already there. He pre-existed the beginning, hence he's not part of the beginning. In Colossians chapter 1, 16 through 17, Paul put it this way, by him all things were created, and nothing was created that he didn't do it. He existed before all things, and all things are under his sovereign control. Thus, he cannot be a thing. And it's, it's so fundamental. I remember talking with the Jehovah's Witness, and I took him to John 1, and then I took him to Colossians, that Jesus created all things, thus he cannot be a thing. Well, he's a little dense. He couldn't get it. I said, well, let me explain it this way. If I said, hi, I'm Bob Morey, the creator and the manufacturer of all widgets. If you got a widget in your house, look on the bottom. Yep, Morey. That's it, Morey Corporation. I created all widgets. Then hello, I am not a widget. 
Don't confuse me with what I made. When Scripture says Jesus Christ was already in existence in eternity before the universe began. It then goes on to say, verse 3, all things came into existence through him. And apart from his power, his sovereignty, his will, his plan, nothing came into being that has come into being. We see because Jesus Christ created all things, hello, he cannot be reduced to a created thing, no matter how exalted. Well, he was the first one created, or he was glorious. Nah, uh, 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 uh. When the beginning of things began, he was already there because he's the one who manufactured all things. Ipso facto, he cannot be a thing. Thus, John does not begin with the story of the shepherds. He doesn't begin with the angel choirs. He doesn't begin with the story of the tax system and poor Joseph and Mary having to go to the tax, the IRS center. He says, look, we're going to talk about the identity of the Christ. We're going to go right back to the creation. Let's go all the way back to the beginning of everything. He was already there. And he was already there because he was, as a matter of fact, the creator of everything. He said, now why does John want to talk about that? Because you see, this then puts in bold the incarnation. It's the creator, the creator, who was willing to come in the form of a creature. He who was omnipotent in power who simply spoke, let there be light, and there was light, who spoke the universe into existence. Such infinite power, he was omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, all of the omni-attributes go with the Creator God Himself. This same Creator, Verse 14, became enfleshed, incarnate. That's where we get incarnation. And tabernacled among us, put up a tent of his flesh. And here you have the pre-existence. The Word was in existence before the universe. The Word now sets up a body as a tent and came and tabernacled among us. And we saw his glory. Glory! Any Christ who is not quite God would not have a glorious birth. Now, I realize those of you who are parents, your kids are very precious to you. And you may think, boy, the birth of my kids was really glorious. You know, nowadays I had this one couple he tried to push me into the living room. I have a videotape I took in the delivery room. And you see Peter coming, and I said, Whoa! Too much information. I'm, I, front all that. <laughs> Save that for you in private. Well, he thought it was glorious to see the birth and that baby and the crowning and everything. Get with the program. You were born too. Everyone here was birthed. You had a little cord, looked like a telephone cord. You never knew that until you actually are there and you see that the little cord looks like, you know, the expandable uh, telephone cord. I didn't know. When you're not married, you don't know. Then you find out. The doctor lets you snip it and all that stuff. It's great. A birth is a birth. The birth of Jesus, if it is not the incarnation of inter eternal deity, is not glorious. It is glorious because the Creator God enfleshed, He incarnated. In His humility, He took upon Himself the form of a human person, a man, and dwelt among us. The Creator in our midst. Whoa! This should blow your mind. Get up into the mountains. 
a clear night and look at the stars, the one who created all of them. Then go get your National Geographic and look at what the Hubble telescope is showing us. The brilliant colors, the galaxies, the mind-boggling. The one who created all of that came to this planet for the sake of you and me, that we might be redeemed from the divine justice and the wrath of Almighty God. The Creator became flesh. The Creator dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. That's why the cradle is important, because the cradle is where the evidence of the incarnation. That's why two years later, after they were in a house, the wise men showed up. And I know the mythology, they have the wise men and they have a fourth one and they have this, they have that, and they're with the shepherds. Well, that's for the Catholics. They never read the Bible anyway. <laughs> they just sort of jumbled it all together. No, you, the text says two years later after they were in a house. You were in the house. Uh, now look. You were in town. The water broke. Even Motel 6 was booked. Someone said, well, I got a stable. Uh, you can go in there, at least it's warm. Now, are you going to stay there? Or are you going to get a place as soon as you can for your wife and your kid? Hello, if you're a man, you would. So they said they were in the house. The wise men came to the house. So Herod decided to kill every boy two years and younger. Why? Just to play it safe because it was around two years, you see. Kill them off. Get them, make sure we get them good. Get them before two, before it's too late. The cradle is the incarnation of the Creator when He took upon Himself the form of a frail human being. Truly human. He cried at the death of His good friend Lazarus. He was surprised. He got angry. He had to learn his alphabet. He grew in wisdom and stature, both with men and God. He had to go to the Hebrew school. He had to learn to sing. Aleph, Bey, the Gimel, Dalet, Chet, Che. He had to do all of this perfectly. Straight A's, straight A's, of course. Had to take the garbage out. He, he had to be had to do the whole thing. The Creator humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a man. And for the majority of his life, lived as a humble man who worked in a construction company, not a carpenter. That was a mistranslation of the King James. His family had a construction company. So don't think of him whittling little olive wood goblets and little trinkets from Jerusalem. That's, again, the Catholics. So forget about that. That's just confusion. They had a construction company. They were involved with the Copernican, a building for the Romans there. He went about doing his business, taking care of his mom as a good Jewish boy until it was time for him to go forth into ministry. So for the majority of his life, he lived not in the public view, but he lived a life that we should have lived. You know, the verse says, you shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. He never did, not even once. I'm sorry to say I did. Anybody else here in your lifetime ever take God's name in vain? Yeah. Says you shall not lie. He never did. How many liars do we have here today? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Then Jesus said, yeah, in the mind as well. How many of you guilty in the mind, the flesh? No, somewhere you guilty in there. Don't steal. Oh, I remember we were so poor I used to steal food out of the grocery store got caught with the package of barbecue ribs in my jacket. <laughs> That's right. He said, they caught me and said, what do you got in the uh, uh, ribs? I said, I was hungry. Well, that still don't give an excuse to steal. But how many of you stole? Be honest, you stole. I don't care if it's a quarter off your mother's dresser. That's stealing. He never did. You're going to hell. You're a bunch of idol-worshipping, lying thieves. You're adulterers, quacks. He never was. 
He lived the life you should have lived. He merited eternal life. Remember the voice that boomed off the mountain? Do this and thou shalt live. That's it. We're dead. We're dead. He lived. He merited eternal life. He lived the life you should have lived. That's part of the atonement. Then he died the death. You should have died. We go from creation to the cradle, his life. Then we get to the cross. The cross. Now we enter into the public phase of his ministry. He was the redeemer at the very beginning. You're still in chapter 1. That's why when John the Baptist saw Jesus, verse 29, he says, Behold, he's the Lamb of God, and he's taking away, bearing away the sin of the world right now. Well, how is he doing that? By earning eternal life. We are saved because he was good enough. He did enough good works. He merited it. And when his righteousness is put to our account, we get the reward of eternal life because he earned it. He paid for it. He merited it. Some people, you know, they get these fuzzy brains. I just get eternal life. Somebody got to pay for that. He paid for it. And then the creator who lived the life we should have lived, who put up with all kinds of things, then faced the reality of the cross. Turn with me to John chapter 19. The creator. Now, so many people, these atheists have told me, well, I want God to come down. I mean, you want me to believe in God? I, come on down, huh? I said he already did. And you bumped them off. He'd bump them off a second time. He was here, people. When they say, why doesn't God ever come down? He did. The Creator walked among His creatures, and what did they do? Murdered Him! Beat Him up, slapped Him, whipped Him, spit in His face. Why should He come back for a rerun? Humanity had a chance. John 1, he came into his own things. He came to his own people and they didn't accept him. He was in the world and the world didn't even recognize him. That's why John 19 gives us one of the best descriptions of the crucifixion, chapter 19 and verse 16. So then Jesus was handed over to be crucified. A very terrible death. Very terrible death. Cruel. Painful. Agonizing. And you actually die not because of the blood loss due to the nails in the Hebrew. The, the whole hand, including the wrist, was part of the hand. So with the nail there just below the wrist bone and in the feet you see you actually died because you became so weak you couldn't push yourself up on that pain, the nail, because it was so painful you couldn't breathe. You died because you couldn't breathe. Fixation. Very terrible death. See, this is what John is emphasizing. Who died? Who was murdered? The Creator. The Creator came to the creatures and we used the cruelest death we could think of. We tortured the man. We beat the man. We slapped him. We denied him. We ridiculed him. We mocked him. Why? Because that's what you deserve. That's what I deserve. See, I've done so many sins. Oh, my lands. If you knew how, what I've done, ooh. My. You'd call for a, a cross and some nails. Get old Maury out now. Nothing's too painful for the likes of him. Well, you see, you know what your sins have earned you? The most agonizing, painful death imaginable. That's what you should get. Some of you are guilty of crimes. You just never got caught. 
How many people stole cars here? How many people shoplift? Oh, you'd be surprised. How many people fudged on their taxes? How many people broke this law, that law? The, I would say there's a number of you, if not half of you, should be in jail today if the truth were known. I mean, as a kid, you did, did some things you shouldn't have done. See, you must understand the Creator, the eternal Word, became flesh, dwelt among us, living the life we never lived. Now we come that He must die the death we should have died. He died a painful death because we should. Because the kind of death we deserve is a very cruel and very painful death. It's like when the FBI sat me down and said, um, you plan on going to Israel for their celebration, uh, Jerusalem 3000. I said, yes. How'd you know? He said, we're the FBI. You can go. The Hamas has you on a death list. We can't protect you. And if you go to Israel or you go to any of those Middle Eastern countries, you can't go to them, period. You're in the computer. The moment you land in the airport, up your name will pop the computer. He said, yeah, I'm an American citizen. He said, it doesn't mean anything. They'll put some drugs in your suitcase. They'll have it right in their hand. And I'm in jail for drug dealing, bringing in drugs. And I happen to be murdered and raped and skinned alive. Oh, he said, they'll kill you. But very slowly, very painfully. So I canceled my trip. I was going to go, but my wife persuaded me not to. Well, you know, a typical male, you know, we're invincible. You know, I can take care of myself, you're saying. They handed him over to be crucified. The Creator God nailed to a Roman gibbet. And they took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross. Look at that. The Creator had to even carry the instrument of his torture to the place called the place of a skull, almost like it's a cartoon, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. See, this is why we know, again, you see that he was writing to Christians, many of whom were Gentiles. He had to explain things to them. There they crucified him, and with him two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. Don't tell me that was luck. One to the right, one to the left. When one got saved and one got damned, and there's the sheep and the goat. Don't tell me that was luck. Jesus could have been on the left side. These people, well, I believe in free will. I believe it was possible, you see, that he could have been on the left and one of the things, uh-uh. Uh-uh. This was rigged. It was fixed. Matter of fact, the time of this crucifixion was rigged. It wasn't his unlucky day. Remember, they tried to murder him. And he said, no, no, my time is not yet. This is why when he stood before Pilate, he said, my time is at hand. Now is the time. Now I'm given unto you, you see. It was all time. Pilate wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in three languages, Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Three signs. That's when each gospel writer quoted the particular sign that applied to their audience. So Matthew writing to Aramaic-speaking Jews, guess, guess which sign he quoted? The one in Aramaic. And Luke wrote to Greeks. What language did he happen to quote? So of course they're not the same because each ethnic group had to have more information. Three signs, three languages. And the Jews objected, verse 21, don't write the king of the Jews, but only wrote that he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, see, that's so easy to let it roll off your lip, but if you understand the horror of that, took his outer garments and made 
four parts, a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece, so they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. Now, was that just a free will decision on the part of the soldier? It just was, ha it happened, you know, it happened. Would you read what it says? This happened in order to fulfill Scripture written a thousand years before this ever happened. What do you mean? Somebody predicted that the soldiers would actually gamble for... Yeah. You mean that kind of minute prophecy? Yes. Then if it was predicted, then it was certain. It wasn't iffy. It was not possible they didn't gamble because if they had decided not to gamble, then the Bible would be proven to be false because it had false prophecy. That's why prophecy in the Old Testament, as I have in my book, The Nature and Extent of God's Knowledge, begins with, know of a certainty. Behold, it shall certainly come past. So someone one time asked me, well, Bible prophecy... Uh, is God guessing what might happen given an infinite number? I said, no. Prophecy is what is going to happen certainly because God has decreed it from all eternity and he has fixed it, set it in concrete. This is an example. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my honor garments among them and my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. In other words, you'd either have to say, the free will was violated. What happened to their free will? You've got to understand biblical authors were not following Greek philosophy. They weren't interested in Plato and Socrates and the others. They were not interested at them all. What they knew was this. There's one true living God, maker of heaven and earth, and he's in control of what is. He can tell you the name of the king centuries before the king is around. It says, Cyrus. He can give you the minutia of the crucifixion. Guess how many Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled the day Christ died. Let that sink in. Thirty-three. Thirty-three. Well, it was lucky. It was the roll of the... It's not roll of... The dice, a cosmic crap game up against the wall of the universe. No. This is why it says it was fulfilled. Look in verse 28. Knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill Scripture. The fulfillment of Scripture forever rules out the idea that the universe is based on contingency, chance, and luck. They could not have done otherwise this was to fulfill Scripture. Verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, tell, tell us die. Now the other gospel accounts tell us that he shouted it with a loud voice. So Jesus went out with the shout of victory, not the wimp of defeat. So don't, don't have the picture of poor Jesus, he's up there now. <laughs> oh! I've been crucified. <laughs> Mama! Don't be getting a wussy Jesus. This is the Jesus who died the death you should have died. Who went to hell on the cross. And when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
He was forsaken because that was to be your punishment and my punishment. We had done enough to tick God off. We had said, get out of my life. Notice, you know, notice people do that all the time. Get out of my life. Stop screwing around with me, God. You're messing around with me. Just leave me alone. Let me do my own thing. And then when he sends them to hell, oh, wait, wait, wait. didn't you tell me to get out of your life? Didn't you tell me you don't want me to have anything to do with you? I have a special place where I won't bother you anymore. I will not offer you salvation. You're irritated, these Christians giving you tracts. Be saved! You said, why can't I be in a place with these blinkity blink Christians don't be forcing that? There is a place where there's no evangelism. No salvation. He said, I don't want to go to church. There is a place where there are no churches. No preaching. There is the place. You want God out of your life? He says, okay, honey, you're out in Gehenna, separated from me and mine for all eternity. That's what you said you wanted. You wanted me to bug off? Baby, I'm bugging off. I'm leaving you to a place where your friends, Lucifer, and the demons and the other reprobates, all of you, can chew on each other for eternity. And there won't be a Christian in sight to bother you. Not a Christmas tree. There won't be any Bibles. Nobody morally. You'll all be the same. Snarling, snapping, unregenerate, wicked, foul, blasphemy. Yeah. Really? Yeah, read the book of Revelation. And they cursed the Lamb. The more the wrath came, the more they cursed God. That's why it's eternal, by the way. Why is hell goes on? Because you keep sinning even in hell. What? That's right. You just keep cursing and rebellion and fighting. And, and God says, okay, give him another uh, shovel load of coal. And the guy lets out a curse. There goes another shovel load. A few wax you won't stop the sinning and God will not stop the punishing and it will go on and on and on forever you see this is the meaning of the cross the creator Taltalistai paid off our sins in full and what happened on that cross 33 prophecies again verse 36 these things happened to fulfill Scripture. Not a bone of him shall be broken. Thirty-three prophecies fulfilled in one day. In one day. A scholar at Moody Bible Institute figured out statistically what are the chances of thirty-three prophecies being fulfilled by one man in one day, all of them put together thousands of years old. It's just astronomically impossible. Unless God did it. Unless it was divine appointment, predetermined, predestined, preordained, fixed, set in concrete, baby. You betcha. So when it comes to the cross, it's the Creator on the cross. Willing to die to take the hell that we deserve, that we might give, be given the reward of eternal life that he earned. See, see, that's the mix. You give Jesus what you've earned. Hell. He gives you what he's earned. Eternal life. The cross is when the creator paid off the debt to divine justice that had been incurred through sin. Now we come to the crypt there in chapter 19, verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might 
take away the body of Jesus and Pilate granted permission so he came and took away the body and you remember there was a beautiful tomb no one had been in it verse 41 there was a garden a new tomb and he was put in there that was to fulfill scripture Isaiah 53 his grave would be made there that was the fulfillment of scripture before his death after his death fulfillment of scripture now folks what does this mean everything the Bible predicts is happening is going to come true it is there's a day of judgment you're gonna be there I'm gonna be there if you're gonna take your stand I'll stand and I'll face God on the basis of my own life I'll take it like a man well you'll be in hell faster than than you can blink an eye on the day of judgment God will say to Bob Morey well done thou good and faithful servant because he's looking at the life of Jesus Christ he will say that Bob Morey never sinned and for thirty three and a half years I always went about doing the work of my father I declare you not guilty case closed Bob Morey inherits eternal life because the life of Jesus Christ was put on my record Jesus Christ took the rap and took the punishment for me well, all to fulfill scripture and now the body of Jesus is put into the crypt we move from creation to cradle to cross to the crypt fulfillment of scripture and the glorious part is when the tomb was found empty and on the first day of the week Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone taken away she ran and told Peter and to the other disciple to John they've taken away the Lord we don't know where he is Peter and the other disciple went forth and they were going to the tomb the two of them were running one was a wheezing old fisherman and the other this runner and John said well I have to admit I ran him came to the tomb first left that old geezer huffing and puffing back there too many fish tacos <laughs> huffing and puffing stooped in saw the linen Peter finally dragged himself in saw the linen saw the place now John verse 8 the one who first came to the tomb he saw he understood and he believed Jesus Christ was raised from the dead the crypt was not the end just as the cradle was not the beginning of Jesus neither was the crypt the end of Jesus there's the post existence of Jesus as well as the pre existence of Jesus with eternity on either side he believed he was smart back some of the others didn't Mary later came and you have the story finally she sees Jesus standing there he speaks to her verse 16 Mary she turned and said to him in Aramaic Rambonai and he said stop clinging to she tackled him the Greek says she ran over she said I lost you once honey I ain't losing you again she went wrapped her arms around his ankles I ain't letting you go he says get off woman stop clinging get off I, I have things I have to do go tell my brethren I ascend to my father and your father and my God and your God so you have the empty crypt the fact that it was not the end any more than the cradle was the beginning any view of Jesus that has him beginning in the cradle and ending at the crypt is not the biblical Jesus the one who came into the cradle was the eternal word the creator of the universe and the one who came out of the empty tomb and who ascended on high and because he ascended on high he has been given the name which is above every name and he sat down and was crowned Lord of Lords and King of Kings that's why in Acts 2 and in Philippians 1 
the Lordship of Christ, Yahvehship, the fact that he was true deity, Yahweh, the sovereign Lord, the Yahweh of armies, the reason that was conferred upon him as a result of his obedience in life, his obedience is death, his mighty resurrection, his ascension, and now God has proclaimed him, Lord. We go from creation to the cradle, to the cross, to the crypt, and then the final one, to the crown, the crown. Because you see, the Jesus who came out of the tomb is now Lord of Lords and King of Kings. It's not just to be viewed as someone weak. See, that's why we have an empty cross here. As you look on the pulpit, it's an empty cross. I don't want no crucifix. Jesus is no longer crucified. Folks, he's alive forevermore. I know you know crucified Jesus, helpless there. Help me! Help. I don't, he, he, he didn't yell at me to help him. Too many people have these weak, anemic Jesuses out there running around in wheelchairs. You are the only hands. You're the only feet. I can do nothing. I'm in a wheelchair. Wheel me around. No. Jesus is Lord of lords and King of kings. He is seated upon his throne with dignity and power, and he must be viewed as such. That's why in John 20, in closing, we read that there was old doubting Thomas from the part of Israel called Missouri. He said, if I don't see it, I don't believe it. Well, he wasn't there. Verse 25, unless I see with my own eyes his hands, and I better see the imprint of where the nails ripped up the skin. I want to see the jagged holes. And just in case my eyes are playing tricks on me, I want to put my finger up into the place of the nail, and I know that he got that spear into the side. I want to slip my hand right up in there. <laughs> he said, I'm going to be fooled by some dream, a vision, an apparition. See, that's why all the stupid heresy, well, Jesus was only appearing as a vision. Visions don't have nail prints. You can't go touch them. So this guy made a very hard test. Now, you will notice that Doubting Thomas was not blessed for his empiricism, his rationalism. He, he was not blessed. He's not lifted up at this point as the example par excellence. Yes, we shouldn't believe the Bible. Oh, we have to see it for ourselves. He, he, he's actually put forth in the context as an idiot. But you see, the Creator had compassion on this idiot. And eight days later, notice, eight days. So you can see Tommy saying, well, where is he? Huh? Second day, I told you, he ain't showing up. Third day, hey. Experience tell me cadavers don't cadaver. Eight days! Thomas was there. Suddenly Jesus materialized right in the room. The doors were shut. It's like he beamed in, Scotty, beam him in. Stood in the midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he looked at Tommy. Now, notice who talked first, Tommy or Jesus? Tommy did not rush up. Well, all right, I'm going to give a physical exam to whoever you are. I've got my rubber gloves ready. We're going to see. There Jesus was. Peace be unto you. Tommy knew that was Jesus. My sheep here, my... Jesus looked at him. He says, all right. I wasn't there, you think, when you made those boastful statements about empiricism, rationalism. All right. Come on, reach forth your finger. Get, get, you see my hands? All right, put out your hand, thrust it here 
Here, you see where the spear went in? You see the scar? Go ahead. That's what you wanted, isn't it? Don't go on being unbelieving in the Word of God. What do you mean? Jesus said, I would be crucified, and in three days I would be what? Raised from the dead. Thomas doubted the Word of God and wanted to trust his own reason and experience as if man was the origin of truth, justice, moral. He was unbelieving. Jesus said, stop being a ninny. Start believing for once in your life. And at that moment, Thomas, without doing the exam, he didn't do it. After all that talking, he knew the scripture. Jesus gave him the rebuke. You know what you are? You're an unbelieving disciple. How dare you doubt my word? In three days I would be raised from the dead. How dare you doubt the testimony? Be believing! It was a rebuke. Well, Tommy, at that moment, in his heart said, Lord, I do believe. I accept your word. I don't need to have the empirical verification. I don't need it. I believe it. And Thomas answered and said, now in your Bible, the words to him need to be underlined. Some modern translations drop it out because they don't want this statement to indicate to the reader that Thomas believed that Jesus was Lord and God. Ho curios mu kai ha fehas mu. And the words to him become very important. See, without to him, if it just said, Thomas replied, comma, my Lord, my God, you've risen from the dead, oy vey. It could have been, you know, Zsa, Zsa Gabor getting excited over a new poodle. It was an exclamation. But that's not what the text says. Thomas said to him, ho curios mu, kai ha fehas mu, the Lord of me and the God of me, my Lord and my God. I say it to you, not up in the air somewhere in the stratosphere, the divine ether. I say it to you, Jesus. You are my Lord and you are my God. And Jesus said, do you believe this because you've seen me? Pathetic! Pathetic! Blessed are those who do not see. And yet what? He said, no, wait a second. This is the end of evidentialism. Yes. Is it more blessed to believe God's word? Or is it more blessed to say, I must have empirical verification, logical syllogisms. I myself must see that it is more blessed to believe in God's revelation. That's where the blessing is. He didn't get blessed because he ran around. It is more blessed to believe the word of God which is more certain than science, which changes all the time. Psychology, what a den of thieves and liars inhabit that particular cage. So where are you going to go? The word of God or the word of some fallible, tricksy people who don't know what they believe by tomorrow afternoon? It is more blessed you take God's word you have not seen. Sight unseen on the raw power of God's word. See, that's what is the difference. Here's the point. Thomas proclaimed that the risen Christ was now Lord and God. Now you see the genius of John's gospel. He began with the Word. When the beginning began, the Word already was, and the Word was God. And he ends with Tommy saying, 
God, he begins and ends his gospel by emphasizing to the Christians, don't reduce Jesus to a mere mortal man. He is God, a very God. This is the Christ of Christmas in the Gospel of John in five acts. Creation, cradle, cross, crypt, and crown. Amen. This has been a Faith Defenders audio presentation. For more information on the Ministry of Faith Defenders, visit faithdefenders.com or call 1-800-41-TRUTH. That's 1-800-41 and the word truth.